have come here today to announce my candidacy for the Democratic nomination for President of the United States. And my, my mission over the next 18 months of this campaign and throughout my presidency will be to end the corrupt merger of state and corporate power that is threatening now, is threatening now to impose a new kind of corporate feudalism on our country, to commoditize our children, our Purple Mountain's majesty, to poison our, our children and our people with chemicals and pharmaceutical drugs to strip mine our assets, to hollow out the middle class and keep us in a constant state of war. My father, just before he died, told me very sadly, people in authority lie. And the government now lies to us. We all know it. We take it for granted. When my uncle, when he died in 1963, about 80% of Americans said they trusted their government. Today, 22% trust their government, and 22% trust the press, the lowest level ever. The media is at the lowest need because we know the media lies to us now, and everybody knows that. The problem is, and, and, so, and the problem is that when there's sources of information that we're always used to and that we need to rely on in a democracy, when they start lying to us, Americans look for other sources because they know they're being lied to and they look for other sources of the truth. And when the corporate captive media and the corporate captive government sees other sources of truth, they have to brand those misinformation because they threaten their paradigm. They threaten that orthodoxy. And, and of course there is a lot of genuine misinformation, but as we know, a lot of the misinformation is just statements that depart from government orthodoxy, so they have to either censor us or they have to lie about what's true and what's not true. And that amplifies the polarization. It amplifies the hatred, the fear, the insecurity, because you know you're being lied to and then you're being silenced. The censorship doesn't work from any point of view, and it's very, very dangerous. If we want to meet our obligation as a generation, as a civilization, as a nation, which is to create communities for our children that provide them with the same opportunities for dignity and enrichment and prosperity and good health as the communities that our parents gave us, we've got to start by protecting our environmental infrastructure, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the wildlife, the fisheries the public lands, those things that are not reducible to private property but by their nature are the property of all of us, the commons, the commonwealth, the public trust assets, uh, the landscapes, the waterways that connect us to the 10,000 generations of human beings that lived before there were laptops and that ultimately connect us to God. And, God, God, God talks to human beings through many vectors, through each other, through organized religion, through the great books of those religions, through wise people, through art and music and uh, literature and poetry. But nowhere with such detail and grace and color and joy as through creation. And when we... When we, when we destroy a species, 
when we destroy a special place, we're diminishing our capacity to sense the divine, understand who God is and what our own potential is as human beings. And Father, Father Martin once told me that the definition of sin is an injury to another human being or to God, to our relationship with God. And my children are gonna grow up in a world where they will never see the kind of explosions of color from butterflies that I saw every time I walked into my garden as 80 or 90% of the butterflies are gone, the flying insects. They'll never hear the songbirds that I heard because 80% of them are gone. They'll never see the puddles that I saw as a boy the bubbling like cauldrons with tadpoles from, you know, from salamanders and frogs. They're not gonna see that in their lifetime. They're unaware of it. And it's like God is a tapestry and he's talking to us from all of these different vectors and we're pulling threads out of that capacity and it is such a crime against our children. And I think... I think we deserve a president in this country who cares about these things and who talks about these things to the American people. I'm going to talk about lockdowns, um, and nobody wants to talk about it, I, but we need to understand, you know, I grew up at a time, most of my life was at a time that economists call the Great Prosperity. It's when the American middle class between 1945 and 75 grew to be the biggest economic engine in the, on the face of the globe. I mean, we were the economy in the globe. We made everything, and everybody looked to us, not only for goods, but for moral leadership, and we became the most powerful country in the world, unrivaled, and it was because, and we had a stable democracy with institutions that people trusted, a press that told us the truth. You know, everybody knows it's an economic and political economic rule. You cannot have democracy in a society where there is high concentrations of wealth and widespread poverty. You need a middle class, or you don't get democracy. And uh, that, that is a law, that is a law. You cannot do it, that. you cannot do it unless you have a big middle class, and we had that. Uh, but since the early 1980s, there's been a systematic attack on our middle class, and the coup de grace was the lockdown. The lockdown was the biggest shift in wealth in human history, and I'm gonna tell you about that in a second. And I blame President Trump for the lockdown. Now, a lot of people will say, a lot of people say, and President Trump gets blamed for a lot of things that he didn't do, and he gets blamed for some things that he did do. But the worst thing that he did to this country, to our civil rights, to our economy, to the middle class in this country was the lockdown. Now, President Trump, in fairness, let me just make this point, will tell people well, the lockdown wasn't my idea. It was my bureaucrats rolled me on it. I was saying we shouldn't do it. But that's not a good enough excuse. He was the president of the United States. He, and as Harry Truman said, the buck stops here. On May 2nd, 2020, 600 doctors wrote, signed a letter to President Trump begging him not to do, allow the lockdowns. And they said, because at, at that time, all of the pandemic protocols anywhere in the world, the WHO, CDC, everywhere, the European Health Agency, all says you never do mass lockdowns. It causes much worse havoc and deaths and injuries than if you do the standard protocol, which is you lock down the, the sick, you protect, the vulnerable, and you let everybody else go back to work. Otherwise, you are going to wreak havoc. And of course, you know, and I wrote, I wrote about it for the, um, you know, on Instagram, I was writing every day. I was citing these economic studies that showed 
Every point in unemployment, you get, you get 37,000 excess deaths from heart attacks, suicides, you know, plus imprisonments. And I was writing about this. And they dumped me from the social. They said, that's misinformation. But it was not. But people were saying it. People knew it. It wasn't just me. And we now know, of course, that it's true. There's now study after study. And any, every comparison between the states and nations that locked down compared to those who didn't, you know, has shown the ones who locked down, the more you locked down, the worse you got. The worse COVID deaths, worse excess deaths. Sweden's numbers came out this week. Sweden was the only country in Europe that didn't lock down. It had the lowest excess deaths in Europe, which is very predictable. <laughs> the nation, you know, the nation that led the lockdowns was us, and we had the highest body count of COVID on Earth. We have 4.2% of the world's population. We had 16% of the COVID deaths. At some point, even the media is going to have to say, it. stop saying this was a success story. We, oh. but, but, but the, the health issues were almost dwarfed by the economic cataclysm that befell our country. The, uh, the IMF and the Harvard study by Larry Summers says the cost of the lockdown to the United States was 16 trillion dollars. 16 trillion for nothing. 16 trillion dollars. We shifted 4 trillion dollars from the middle class in this country to the super rich. We created 500 new billionaires. The existing billionaires increased their wealth according to the Oxfam study that came out three days ago by 30 percent. This was a gift to the rich. And guess what? The ones who were, the, the people who got riches were the social media companies like Amazon and Facebook and Microsoft that were conspiring with President Trump's White House to censor people like me. So the, the very people who were profiting on those lockdowns were the ones who were strip mining the wealth from the middle class in this country. Amazon got to close down all of its competitors. 3.3 million businesses it shut down. And I'm suing, I'm in a lawsuit involving Amazon for censoring one of my books. So they were censoring people who criticized the lockdowns while they were raking in the money from the lockdowns. And, and unfortunately, Unfortunately, President Trump, President Trump's White House was colluding with them. 41% um, of black businesses shut down, most of them permanently. My whole family, including myself, have long personal relationships with President Biden. Many of my family members are working in the administration. Uh, many of them also dis just plain disagree with me on issues like censorship, on war, on public health, and they are entitled to their beliefs, and I respect their opinions on them, and I love them back. And my hope... <laughs> and is it too much to hope that we could have the same thing for our country? We have a polarization in this country today that is so toxic and so dangerous and at any time since the Civil War. During the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And when I talk to both Republican friends and Democratic friends, they talk about this division in almost apocalyptic terms. Nobody can see a safe way or a good way out of it. And people are preparing for a kind of a dystopian future. And one of the principal missions of my campaign and of my presidency is going to be to end that division. Yeah. And, 
and I'm going to try to do that by encouraging people to talk about the values that we have in common rather than the issues that keep us apart. I'm going to do that by telling the truth to the American people. Because that is the core. That is the core of this division, of course. When we fight each other, when blacks fight whites and Republicans fight Democrats and uh, rural fights are urban, the people, that merger of corporate power that sits at the top is loving the fighting between us, among us, so that they can strip mine our country. I spent 35 years as an environmental advocate. And at the beginning of my environmental career, end of 1983, the beginning of 1984, a man who was a mentor of mine offered me a job doing high-level environmental policy in Washington or New York or another job that was kind of doing large purchases of, of conservation land. And I didn't want to do that kind of environmentalism. I wanted to be in the trenches, working with people, and in, engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat against the big polluters. And I wanted to particularly work with people who were most harmed by environmental injury, but also were alienated or marginalized from the mainstream environmental community. My first case as an environmental lawyer was representing the NAACP in a lawsuit against Austin in New York for trying to put a waste transfer station in the oldest black neighborhood in the Hudson Valley. And I found out during that lawsuit that four out of every five toxic waste dumps in our country is in a black neighborhood. The largest toxic waste dump in this country is Emile, Alabama, which is 85% black. The highest concentration of toxic waste dumps in this country is the south side of Chicago. The most contaminated zip code in California is East LA. And black youth, probably the largest at that time problem with black youth, was that 48% of them had dangerous levels of lead in their blood. And that led, uh, redu dramatically reduced IQ and also causes severe behavioral problems. You know, I spent a lot of my time over the next 30 years fighting on those kind of issues. I spent summer vacation in jail in uh, maximum security prison in Puerto Rico in 2001 because I had successfully sued the Navy to stop bombing probably the poorest community in our country, the people, the black and brown people who live on the island of Vieques who are American citizens, uh, but they are not treated that way. <laughs> White Eisenhower warned against the military industrial complex and what it, that it would destroy democracy. My father died in his campaign against the Vietnam War. Martin Luther King broke with the civil rights movement on Vietnam and he said, this has got to be our priority because you don't, you're not seeing that there is a direct link between poverty and violence and oppression at home and war abroad. You cannot separate them. As long as we're making war, as long as our major exports our weapons in war, we will never have a middle class in this country. And my uncle, President Kennedy, his best friend Ben Bradley, asked him, what do you want in your gravestone? What's your epithet? And he said he kept the peace. That's what he wanted. He said the principal job of every president of the United States was to keep our country out of war. And he succeeded in doing it. And he succeeded in doing that. And instead, he started investing in the Kennedy Milk Program and Alliance for Pro Progress, the USAID, to 
rebuild the middle, to build middle classes in the country so that they could enjoy democracy. He started the Peace Corps because he said he wanted foreigners to know Americans not by you know, military uniforms, but by people who came in their communities to help him. And you know, it's very, very difficult to, to, to fairly judge the, who the best presidents in our history were. You know, uh, historians take polls of each other, take polls of the public to try to figure out who's the best. But there is one objective metric, and that is, at least for foreign policy, which president has the most statues to him abroad, most universities named after him, the most hospitals named after him, most roads and boulevards and avenue, and nobody comes close to John F. Kennedy. Yeah. Oh, and that, if people love our country, that's good for our economy and it's good for our security. And that's what we had with my uncle. He used to love the fact that there were Africans who were naming their children Washington and Jefferson and Lincoln, but they weren't naming them Marx and Lenin. He used to say that. I think probably the proudest thing, if he could know of all the memorials to him, the one he'd be proudest of is the tens of thousands of African children. I've met many of them in my lifetime, and Latin American children, and Asian and Mideastern children who are named Kennedy. And I'm going to tell you this. When my uncle came into office two months later. He was fighting his intelligence apparatus, his military, because they wanted to do the Bay of Pigs. He was totally against it, and he let them roll over him. And in the middle of the Bay of Pigs, he realized they were lying to him, and he realized the function of the intelligence agencies had become to provide the military industrial complex with a constant pipeline of war. And he came out during the middle of the night during the Bay of Pigs catastrophe, and he said, I want to take the CIA. Alan Dulles had lied to him. Charles Cabell, Richard Bissell, Louis Lemitzer, Curtis LeMay had all lied to him through their teeth. And he said, I want to take the CIA and shatter it into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the winds. <laughs> A couple of children have asthma, one out of every four black children now in urban areas has asthma. The asthma events are triggered by bad air days, by ozone and particulates. It's coming mainly from coal burning power plants. So those plants, General Electric Company privatized the fish in the Hudson River. They privatized the river to make profits for themselves through corruption. Those coal generators are privatizing the air in my children's lungs. And we have to understand that it is an act of theft. Pollution is a subsidy and it's an act of theft. I wanted to work with rural Americans and working class Americans, and particularly hunters and fishermen, the hook and bullet people who cared deeply as much as any other American about the environment, and yet they felt completely alienated from the mainstream environmental community. So I spent my career working for a blue-collar coalition of commercial and recreational fishermen who mobilized on the Hudson River in 1966 to reclaim the river from its polluters. And over the next couple of decades, we bought over 500 successful legal actions against the Hudson River polluters. <laughs> And today, today, the Hudson River is an international model for ecosystem protection. This is a river that caught fire. It, uh, it, was, it was dead for 20 mile stretches north of New York City, south of Albany. It turned colors depending on what color they were painting the GM tr trucks at Terrytown, the Terrytown, G uh, the Terrytown GM plant. Uh, today, it's the richest waterway in the North Atlantic. It produces more pounds of fish per acre. And more biomass per gallon than any other waterway in the Atlantic Ocean, north of the equator. And, the, la and the, the, the miraculous resurrection of the Hudson has inspired the creation of river keepers, water keepers now, 350 of them in 46 countries. We're now the biggest water protection group in the world. Uh, one of the...
But the, you know, the, the, the story of the Hudson also has a sad ending because General Electric Company dumped its PCBs into the Hudson to save money at its capacitator plant. And the PCBs, although they've spent a billion dollars trying to get them out, there's another three and a half billion that nobody's ever gonna pay. Oh, the commercial fish are, many of the species are too toxic to eat and it's the commission, commercial fishery has been almost altogether closed. 2,000 families that I represented now, there's uh, probably two left. And those are families that enrich the history, the culture, the palate of New York uh, for three and a half centuries. And they're gone not because their business plan didn't work, because it did work for three and a half centuries. The thing that didn't work, free market capitalism worked perfectly for them. What didn't work was corporate crony capitalism. Was the General Electric Company <laughs> had better lobbyists. General Electric did not have a better business plan, it just had better lobbyists, so it was able to escape the discipline of the free market, corrupt public officials, dump its PCBs in the river, put you know my fishermen out of work, and everybody in the Hudson Valley now has General Electric's PCBs and their flesh and organs. Uh, that's what corporate crony capitalism does. One of the things that I learned from the fishermen is that there's no daylight between environmental, good environmental policy and good economic policy. And, and you'll hear this mantra, this trope from the big polluters and their indentured servants in, on Capitol Hill, that uh, we have to choose between economic prosperity and environmental protection. And that's a false choice in 100% of the situation. Good environmental policy is identical to good economic policy. <laughs> if, if, if we want to measure our economy, and this is how we ought to be measuring it, based upon how it produces jobs and the dignity of jobs over the generations and how it preserves the value of the assets of our community. If, on the other hand, we want to do what the big polluters are urging us to do, which is to treat the planet as if it were a business in liquidation, convert our natural resources to cash as quickly as possible, have a few years of pollution-based prosperity, we can generate an instantaneous cash flow and the illusion of a prosperous economy, and we can make a few people billionaires by impoverishing the rest of us. But our children are gonna pay for our joyride, and they're gonna pay for it with denuded landscapes, poor health, huge cleanup costs that are not gonna amplify over time, and that they'll never be able to pay. Environmental injury is deficit spending. It's a way of loading the cost of our generation's prosperity onto the backs of our children. <laughs> And one of the things that I've done over the past 30 years as an environmental advocate is to constantly go around and confront uh, this argument that an investment in our environment is a diminishment of our nation's wealth. It doesn't diminish our wealth. It's an investment in infrastructure, the same as investing in telecommunications or road construction. It's an investment we have to make if we're gonna ensure the economic vitality of our generation and future generations. I'm going to talk about lockdowns. Um, and nobody wants to talk about it. I, but we need to understand, you know, I grew up at a time most of my life was at a time that economists call the Great Prosperity. It's when the American middle class between 1945 and 75 grew to be the biggest economic engine in the, on the face of the globe. I mean, we were the economy in the globe. We made everything and everybody looked to us, not only for goods, but for moral leadership. And we became the most powerful country in the world, unrivaled. And it was because, and we had a stable democracy with institutions that people trusted, a press that told us the truth. You know, everybody knows it's an economic and political economic rule. You cannot have democracy in a society where there is high concentrations of wealth and widespread poverty. You need a middle class or you don't get democracy. And so, that, that is a law, that is a law. You cannot do it, that. you cannot do it unless you have a big middle class, and we had that. 
Uh, but since the early 1980s, there's been a systematic attack on our middle class. And the coup de grace was the lockdown. The lockdown was the biggest shift in wealth in human history. And I'm going to tell you about that in a second. And I blame President Trump for the lockdown. Now, a lot of people will say, a lot of people say, and President Trump gets blamed for a lot of things that he didn't do, and he gets blamed for some things that he did do. But the worst thing that he did to this country, to our civil rights, to our economy, to the middle class in this country, was the lockdown. Now, President Trump, in fairness, let me just make this point, will tell people, well, the lockdown wasn't my idea. It was my bureaucrats rolled me on it. I was saying we shouldn't do it. But that's not a good enough excuse. He was the President of the United States. The, and as Harry Truman said, the buck stops here. On May 2nd, 2020, 600 doctors wrote, signed a letter to President Trump begging him not to do, allow the lockdowns. And they said, because at, at that time, all of the pandemic protocols anywhere in the world, the WHO, CDC, everywhere, the European Health Agency, all says you never do mass lockdowns. It causes much worse havoc and deaths and injuries than if you do the standard protocol, which is you lock down the, the sick, you protect the vulnerable, and you let everybody else go back to work. Otherwise, you are going to wreak havoc. And of course, you know, and I wrote, I wrote about it for the, um, you know, on Instagram, I was writing every day. I was citing these economic studies that showed every point in unemployment you get, you get 37,000 excess deaths from heart attacks, suicides, you know, plus imprisonments. And I was writing about this. And they dumped me from social. They said, that's misinformation. But it was not. But people were saying it. People knew it. It wasn't just me. And we now know, of course, that it's true. There's now study after study and any, every comparison between the states and nations that locked down compared to those who didn't, you know, has shown the ones who locked down, the more you locked down, the worse you got. Worse COVID deaths, worse excess deaths. Sweden's numbers came out this week. Sweden was the only country in Europe that didn't lock down. It had the lowest excess deaths in Europe, which is very predictable. If the nation, you know, the nation that led the lockdowns was us, and we had the highest body count of COVID on Earth. We have 4.2% of the world's population. We had 16% of the COVID deaths. At some point, even the media is going to have to say, it. stop saying this was a success story. We, oh. But, but, but the, the health issues were almost dwarfed by the economic cataclysm that befell our country. The, uh, the IMF and the Harvard study by Larry Summers says the cost of the lockdown to the United States was $16 trillion. $16 trillion for nothing. $16 trillion. We shifted $4 trillion from the middle class in this country to the super rich. We created 500 new billionaires. The existing billionaires increased their wealth, according to the Oxfam study that came out three days ago, by 30%. This was a gift to the rich. And guess what? The ones who were, the, the people who got riches were the social media companies like Amazon and Facebook and Microsoft that were conspiring with President Trump's White House to censor people like me. So the, the very people who were profiting on those lockdowns were the ones who were strip mining the wealth from the middle class in this country. Amazon got to close down all of its competitors. 3.3 million businesses it shut down. And I'm suing, I'm in a lawsuit involving Amazon for censoring one of my books. So they were censoring people who criticized the lockdowns while they were raking in the money from the lockdowns. And, and unfortunately,
Unfortunately, President Trump, President Trump's White House was colluding with him. Um, 41% uh, of black businesses shut down, most of them permanently.